the, the last time I uh, followed Peter Richardson in a, in a talk, he had just uh, finished making a comment about uh, bone and joint surgeons being loaded. Uh, and the word, what we discovered is the word loaded means something very different in the States. It means drunken uh, as opposed to wealthy. Uh, so we, we, I was thinking, hmm, and they're, they're coming out of a surgery procedure, and hmm, didn't sound good. Uh, so uh, if you remember uh, yesterday, uh, I had four minutes uh, to, uh, to make a presentation on Impact Visor. Uh, part of uh, what I'm going to show you today is uh, another visor that Highwire is working on called Prospect Visor. Uh, and uh, what I'm looking for uh, is actually uh, your ideas uh, uh, on what uh, such a tool would need to be able to do uh, for you. And uh, there might be at uh, many of your seats a, uh, a piece of paper that has some questions on it, um, uh, helping us understand what kind of data you need, uh, what kind of information you'd like to be able to put together that right now is difficult to put together, and what kind of tools uh, you'd like. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your answers uh, to this in uh, some time. I, I hope we're going to reserve for the Q&A. Uh, but if you have uh, thoughts on this, and how can people who aren't in the first row see the bottom line of this? Uh, if if uh, you have thoughts on this, uh, that don't manage to uh, get in the Q&A. Uh, you can write them on the piece of paper, hand it to Lorraine uh, or to me, or send an email to sack at highwire.org. I'm going to focus on uh, talking about uh, relationships, uh, uh, data, and tools. And I want to start uh, by talking about uh, the relationships. I'm actually going to skip. Well, actually, let me just uh, briefly uh, talk about this slide. Um, you know, uh, marketing and sales really has changed uh, uh, in the last few decades. And, uh, you know, what uh, I've been in, involved uh, in scholarly publishing since the 90s. Uh, and even then, though, many of the publishers we worked with, uh, uh, the, the big advance was to take the print catalog that they were creating each year and turn it into a PDF and email it. That was the advance over the 80s. Uh, and then in, in the 2000s, people created marketing homepages, uh, which is essentially an online catalog. Um, but uh, what I propose to you is that in the 2010s, the decade that we're in now, uh, what, what you want to do is turn your marketing and sales uh, efforts into relationship-oriented and data-driven, in other words, targeted, uh, based on the knowledge that you have built into your systems. Uh, and I'd like to go over what knowledge I think you have uh, in your systems uh, and see if that is, you can validate that, but also see what you can do with that knowledge. So uh, the first uh, uh, question is, what are the relationships that you have? And uh, many of us uh, for years have tended to focus on what I'll call the relationships at the bottom uh, here. Uh, relation, sorry, I'm going to lose the audio. Hold on. I was prepared for this. I don't know if you could see that. Of course, you can't in the back. Yes, uh, you can. Yeah. Uh, but you probably can't see the laser pointer. Um, uh, the relationships at the bottom of the, uh, of the page here uh, are the, the traditional ones uh, that uh, publishers have focused on, you know, essentially uh, the readers, uh, the e-commerce users, the turned away users, and especially uh, the librarians uh, and institutions who subscribe. Uh, what I want to propose to you is that uh, for small publishers, and I think Peter mentioned this uh, uh, in his advice, that you're, you're closer to the community uh, if you're a small publisher, you can leverage the relationships you have with editors, with reviewers, with members, uh, and with authors. Uh, and I'm going to come back to why I think you can, you, you can do that, uh, should do that, probably must do that uh, in order to see growth in journal subscriptions. Um, so how would you know, I, I think you all know the answer to this if you're a small publisher, 
uh, how would you know who your editors, reviewers, members, and authors are? Well, you have this information in various systems and databases uh, that you, you already uh, have access to. Uh, and the problem uh, isn't that you don't have this information. It's hard to use for a, a marketing and sales purpose. Uh, but I think you need to. Uh, and so part of our interest is in understanding that so we can develop, we at Highwire can develop tools that you can use to do that. Uh, but with the more traditional uh, uh, types of relationships, in fact, uh, you have uh, information about these people as well. So for readers, uh, you have information uh, if you have an alerting system. Uh, that is, who is getting your emailed tables of contents. Uh, E-commerce users, you probably have receipts of some sort. Um, turned away users, uh, there's a uh, uh, a, a counter-report uh, that gives you information uh, on those. And uh, I, a question I have for you that I'd like to turn to in the, in the Q&A uh, portion is uh, whether you've used any of these uh, uh, for subscription prospecting, and especially if, if you're interested in subscription prospecting outside of your normal territory, that is, uh, uh, EU uh, and uh, uh, North America, uh, can you factor these lists in some way to help you focus on uh, other countries? Uh, can you identify, if you will, the country of uh, the, the person in each of these lists? Probably not in a fully automated way. Uh, in some cases, you, you may be able to, uh, but uh, there will always be some you can't. The reason I'm, I'm proposing uh, that uh, you need to focus on the relationships uh, to grow in new ways uh, is uh, a comment uh, that we've heard repeatedly from uh, librarians, uh, and this was actually confirmed at the SSP Librarian Focus Group uh, last Monday in Chicago, which I attended. Uh, where the librarians essentially all agreed uh, with one of uh, their statements that we pay attention to personal recommendations from faculty only. Uh, that uh, uh, looking at statistics that tell them that they get so many turnaways uh, from something they don't subscribe is not itself persuasive. Uh, that was an eye opener to me because of course, we were thinking that the counter JR2 was exactly for that purpose. Uh, but the librarians uh, told us that it, it's a personal recommendation, which means that it can't be a, an automated email uh, you know, that uh, uh, an undergraduate uh, clicks on uh, a button on your website that automatically sends uh, a recommendation form uh, that is a, a, a form uh, to a uh, to an institutional librarian. It, it has to be a personal recommendation. It has to come from a faculty member. Uh, it, that's pretty significant because if you think back to those lists uh, that I uh, showed you earlier, they're pretty much all going to be faculty members. Uh, the librarians also uh, agreed with the statement, if something goes on the list, something has to go off the list. So. Uh, in a way, you have to be pretty persuasive, uh, persuasive enough that they're willing to uh, take on the burden of deselecting or deaccessioning uh, uh, something in their uh, suite. Um, I interviewed uh, some uh, Highwire publishers about how they approach uh, this uh, and found that there were some common things in their workflow, uh, and they were not what I thought they'd be. Uh, uh, they attend uh, to retention first. So they're, they're looking f uh, at the JR2 report, for example. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with JR2, but it's the, it's the turnaway report. They're looking at that report first to identify subscribers who are somehow being turned away. Uh, and what that will uh, tell them uh, is uh, that a library might not have a complete set of IP addresses recorded. Uh, so they see this first as a, as a customer service issue. Uh, but they actually rank it more hi uh, higher uh, than developing new subscribers uh, or uh, cross-selling existing subscribers. Uh, 
So I thought that was interesting. Uh, this is a society publisher, not very small uh, in, in the cases I've got in mind, uh, but uh, they focus first on retention. Second uh, is uh, where I was surprised the most uh, is to develop new subscribers. I, I would have guessed that selling to existing subscribers would be easier uh, and would, uh, I mean, you already have a relationship, you, you know who to contact, you have data, et cetera. Uh, so I was surprised uh, that this was third, uh, but second was developing new subscribers. Uh, and I think the, the possibility exists uh, to make this more possible uh, is to cross-reference this kind of information with the other information I mentioned on the previous slides. In other words, editors, reviewers, members, and authors. And I think this is challenging. Uh, even with ORCID, it would be challenging. Uh, we don't, most of us don't have many ORCIDs uh, recorded in our systems yet. Uh, I bet your member database doesn't have any of them. Uh, but we also don't have institution IDs. So even when you know who the individual is, Sometimes it's rather difficult to figure out which institution. So how do you go from uh, an institution uh, to an inst that is of the, an individual to the institution that they are at? So that's uh, part of the challenge that I think uh, is ahead of us and why I'm interested in, in hearing your suggestions uh, on how you've done this or how you would like to do it. Um, this is, uh, these are, uh, uh, sample JR2 reports. I, I know they're, they're too small to read, uh, but they're for three institutions from a single uh, Highwire hosted publisher. Um, this is, shows the whole report. The part that's interesting and important in each of these uh, is uh, essentially the turnaways. Uh, so what this says is that for the particular institution, which was a science library, uh, just called science library, there were 1,400 turnaways uh, uh, for a journal, a particular journal. The second example uh, is actually from Stanford, uh, having this many turnaways uh, for uh, uh, some of the journals, which suggests almost a problem because I'm sure Stanford subscribes to these journals. Uh, and then a, um, a, a mining uh, uh, library having significant turnaways for a journal in biomedicine which is sort of kind of interesting. Um, so uh, let me uh, now turn uh, quickly to what it is that we're, we're working on at Highwire. I'll just uh, show this to you briefly. Uh, I'd be interested in your, in your feedback. Um, yesterday, as I said, you, you saw Impact Visor, uh, which is for visualizing uh, citation metrics uh, and eventually usage metrics and social mentions. Um, what we have going on now is early work, uh, a prototype built, which I'll show you, not demo, but just uh, screenshots of something we call Prospect Visor. Um, uh, it is uh, visual and web-based. Uh, it integrates disparate information, uh, perhaps not enough yet, uh, and it's very much use case focused. In other words, we've, we've focused on what are you trying to accomplish rather than giving you a big database of numbers uh, we've built essentially vertical tools. And, and what I'd like to learn from you is what other data and use cases. Uh, so this is the introductory screen um, for uh, uh, Prospect Visor, which actually puts all the information in a summary form on, on one page. I'll show you briefly what it is. Uh, there's a, a filter by uh, the date of usage that you want to look at. Oh, by the way, these are all turnaways that we're visualizing here. So it's essentially a denied usage in this case. Uh, a filter by journal title. Uh, this is a publisher level tool. Uh, information at the journal level for this particular publisher. They have two, four, six, eight journals uh, on Highwire and this shows different amounts of turnaways uh, for each of them. Uh, then the most turned away institutions, the colors, here in the bars match the journal colors. Uh, a map that shows where the turnaways are, and then uh, uh, data that shows uh, over time what the turnaways look like. And th each of these uh, uh, supports a particular use case. Uh, the first one is uh, drilling down to an institution. 
Uh, so the most turned away institution turns out to be an institution in Turkey. Uh, it, you can probably just see over here on the edge uh, that Turkey is illuminated in the map. Uh, but what we see from uh, this very quickly is that this usage suddenly started in October, November, and December. So you would need to take that into account in, in prospecting. Um, whereas uh, drilling down uh, to this uh, innocuous science library, and you can pull up information about who is science library, um, which is clearly in the United States somewhere, uh, you see much more uh, continuous usage. Uh, uh, but you also see that it's largely uh, turnaways uh, of new journal A. Uh, this is, uh, instead of uh, use cases looking for institutions, it's starting with a journal, highlighting a particular journal, and saying, tell me the institutions that have most been turned away from this particular journal. Uh, you can see that this journal has more turnaways uh, than all the others, uh, and so it might be one you'd want to, in particular, uh, go prospecting for. Uh, and from the timeline, you can see that its turnaways were dominated at the beginning of the year, uh, and something changed uh, later on in the year, perhaps uh, uh, more subscribers or less interest. Any of those are possible. Uh, next is drilling down by country. You're going to send, imagine you're going to send a rep to uh, Australia. Uh, so you click on Australia. It tells you what the top turned away institutions are there. Uh, you then uh, click on Melbourne because it was at the top, and you see that, oh, this was just a spike in October. Uh, so maybe that's not uh, the most important place to go. And in fact, University of Sydney might be a better place uh, to go because it had more continuous uh, set of turnaways. Uh, then you go look in Brazil, and what you see is, unless you are working with Capas in Brazil, you might as well not bother, uh, because that's where all of the subscriptions are, is essentially going through that national consortium. And that's it. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is, is take the next, what do we have, seven minutes, five minutes, um, to hear from you uh, uh, any reactions to the idea of developing uh, essentially trying to drive this uh, through the relationships that you know uh, with uh, members, authors, uh, editorial board members, editors, uh, uh, essentially picking those up and using them to make uh, strong recommendations uh, to institutions, uh, especially, of course, institutions where you could show uh, that there is uh, a need. At, does that resonate? Do you say, no, that's just impossible? Uh, or in order to do this, we'd need X, Y, and Z. Any feedback on that? All right. I will uh, hope that some of you have uh, some feedback to send uh, to me uh, at sac at highwire.org. And uh, please, uh, yes. Uh, questions are welcome too. You don't have to have answers. You can have questions. It, it does relate to. Hello, hello. It's yes, good. Um, it's, it's it's that single view. I think everyone wants. I mean, I've worked for publishers where we focused on turnaways for 15 years, and it's it's nice information to have, but it's absolutely not. You know, the the, the single driver that makes the decision about you know where to make a recommendation. And you've said to yourself about you know the faculty makes a recommendation, not the the statistic that says you've got two million users for one journal. Right. But what does resonate is when you bring when you deliver kind of a, a single picture of the relationship that that institution has with that particular publication. So if you can deliver a shot of view that says here is your usage, here's not just your usage, but here's your turnover, and actually here's your editorial relationship as well. These are the number of authors that have submitted to your journal. Here are the number of referees, reviewers we've had, without naming the reviewers. Here are the number of you know, readers we have for your journal, and here's the subjects. You know, th that kind of single holistic view is much more powerful than just these individual screens. And you know, I've certainly had examples where we had to bring these together with clever sort of Excel programmers to create single views. You know, if it's there and ready-made, you know, it makes it a much, much easier sell. I, uh, that, um, I, I like hearing that. That, I think, really reinforces uh, what I was saying, that these relationships need to be uh, combined with other information you have. You, uh, from what we heard from the librarians, you can't drive subscriptions 
just with this kind of turnaway data. It's not sufficient. It may be necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, I asked a question once in the US conference. We had two journals, right? One was the most used journal in your institution. Undergraduates were, were giving thousands and thousands of downloads. And you had this another journal, which was used by a really elite group of two people. They, they just happened to be, you know, one was a Nobel Prize winner and one was very significant. And you had to cancel between one of those two. You know, what, what role do these statistics play in the decision as to if you're gonna cancel one of those, which, which, which is gonna go? It had no bearing at all. The, they had to support the, 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 the Nobel Prize winner and those thousands of undergraduates were gonna suffer because that journal wasn't gonna be there. Yeah. So it, it's, you've gotta have that single view. You've gotta, it's gotta be more than just the usage, more than just the potential usage for it to become a so, meaningful message. I guess the, then the question uh, back to you and to others is, how do you uh, um, make the, the relationship data usable uh, uh, in talking with institutions, because uh, that to me seems to be a difficult problem without, you know, essentially having people uh, tell us what institutions they're at. Yes, sir. Um, and the, the, the big thing here is about getting the different data sources and blending them together into mm -hmm. one set. Um, you know, and you said earlier on that you're focusing on sort of the vertical tools, focusing on those, which is great because they give a, 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 a release to it. The issue, though, is that if you can the reports, you're sending yourself down an alleyway, mm -hmm. um, whereby if you then want to take, okay, what's my next steps? Well, it's okay, associated with whatever it is, you know, CAPES or whatever else, who are those other authors there? Who are the people on the board? And the challenge often is that you, that's coming from metadata from other sources. Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to link that and combine it. You need to have those matching pairs. And often they will come from disparate sources. Um, they're built up over databases, over periods of time. They don't necessarily match together. You've got inconsistencies of it. And so dirty data becomes a real challenge in being able to do that. Um, and you know, these will give you those sort of dashboard bits, but it's the diving deeper into it and making sure the data links that is your biggest challenge. Um, the technologies are now out there um, to facilitate any size of data that pretty much anybody in this whole industry could think of to blend it all together. Um, and other industries in far larger data sets are doing it. But the cleanliness of the data, having it in one place and then having flexibility to dive into it is, is, is the challenge. Uh, because then you can answer those questions. Yeah, absolutely. They're all the matching pairs that you look for. So, you know, you want it to be readable to an end user. So if I'm looking at the author, it's not necessarily an ID. I don't want to go off to another database to look at the reference of whatever that ID was. Okay, mm -hmm. I want to be able to see it in a readable way to me. That needs to have a matching pair to give it the ID. The ID needs to have it against the authentication. Okay, the authentication needs to have the type. Okay, are they a subscriber? Are they lapsed? Are they corporate? Are they institutional? Um, you know, what, all those other kind of profiles, you want to build that into that set of data. And, and they're the challenges, and without the clean data, it's, 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 a, it's a struggle. The advantage, the great thing about it, though, <coughs> is as you build that out, the data can drive you about where you need to clean it up, hmm. because it's those that have the biggest gaps is where you need to tidy it. So as you start to build it, that gives you opportunities to improve it. But often it's getting over that hump to say, okay, I can't do this because my data's not up to scratch yet. I can, I can certainly uh, 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 credit... Um the, the message that you have to put the data together. Uh, uh, it's a, a key finding uh, in the value proposition for ImpactVisor uh, was that we were putting together data that nobody else had put together before. Uh, data, not just citation data, which you can get from several sources, but metadata, uh, published metadata, unpublished metadata, usage data, social mention data, uh, putting all that together uh, was what made this a powerful product, and, and I'm sure the same is the case here. So uh, maybe we can talk about what the uh, decent data sources are uh, for essentially mining your relationship information uh, in, in, and turning out something that uh, is, is not mostly dirt. Thanks. Yes. To have that single view, mm -hmm. that's that's a real challenge. I mean, how many small publishers buy Ringgold? I mean, Laura could probably say the answer to that. Or how many small publishers, you know, can afford to buy these 
very, very good, very effective intelligence tools, which would be a big part of their overall expenditure. They can't. So there has to be another way for them to, to, to get into those systems. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for the feedback. Thank you very much, John. Thank <laughs> you.